All right, so we are in AP Calculus. Today's date is Monday, August 31st, 2020, 8 31 20. We're talking about IVT and EVT, not MVT. I think that's tomorrow, right? Let's see. No, MVT is 1 7. That's in two days. Yep. Um, oh no, my gosh, it's 1 8, technically. Okay, so what do these stand for? They're theorems, theorems that you have to memorize. They're intermediate value theorem and extreme value theorem. And these are best demonstrated graphically, and then we'll get into the notation and what they actually mean. Um, AP Calculus is one of those kind of critical classes where you just have to have a lot of things memorized. Um, and before I forget, remind me that you need to be doing flashcard practice on my website. Um, if you go to unit one at the very bottom, there's like a Quizlet. You guys need to be doing that Quizlet over and over again. Some of the things we haven't gotten to, so that's okay, but some of them you definitely need to have memorized. You're gonna eventually memorize the whole thing for the test. Um, and you don't need to just randomly riddle off or rattle off. You don't need to just read off the definition of IVT. You need to be able to apply it. But in order to apply it, you need to know it. All right, so let's do some symbolic notation so you'll get used to the notation. Um, if I have a general function, let's call this blue function f of a. So I'm just going to say this is f, or sorry, f of x. Not g of x, not h of x, we'll call it f. That's our function. This blue, it looks like it's a parabola. It might not be, though don't have enough information. Um, if this is f of x, then this point here, this coordinate at x is equal to a, is called what? What are the two coordinate pairs? Does anyone want to tell me? What is the x coordinate? What is the y coordinate? In just pure symbolic notation. Anyone want to try to take a stab at it? The x coordinate is really easy, right? It's just one letter. Yeah, Teflon? A1? A, oh, good, good guess, but we, this might be five. I haven't labeled the axis, so we don't know what the Y coordinate is, but you can symbolically do the Y coordinate because the Y coordinate is F of whatever the X coordinate is. So you can say F of A, that is the Y coordinate. My handwriting could be a little bit better. F of A is the Y coordinate. And then similarly, we have the X and Y coordinate for our second two points. So this brown point, I think is gonna be C comma F of C. The X coordinate is C, the Y coordinate is, we don't know, so F of C. And over here, this is gonna be B comma F of B. All right, nod your heads if you're okay with the way that we do this notation, we're all nodding our heads. Okay, so, um, and I guess it should be, it, it's worth noting what is happening over here on the Y coordinate. What is this Y coordinate right here? What is this Y coordinate? What is this Y coordinate? What are all three of these Y coordinates? You know what they are now. In pure symbolic notation. Yeah, Fiona? Is it F of zero? F of zero, not quite, because um, F of zero would be this point right here. Um, this height right here is F of A, because it corresponds to the height with this point over here. This height of right here, it corresponds to, if I come all the way over here, chunk, it hits that point well, roughly, right? And that is going to be called F of B. F of B. Eva, you're here. Oh my God. Hello. Whoa. It's nice to see you. I missed you. I mean, I missed a lot of people, but um, I haven't seen you in longer because I just saw Fiona just last Friday. <laughs> Uh, how's it going, Eva? It's going good, except math is like really confusing, right? Okay, what are you doing for your math class right now? Right now we're learning limits and all that. Oh yeah, we are also kind of, I mean, we already covered it, but um, we, we learned that, yeah. And we're gonna be continuing to learn it. Yeah, it's just weird how she teaches compared to the way you teach, so I'm still getting used to it. Uh, well, I guess it's kind of a good thing to know other teaching uh, styles too, especially for college. Some professors are way, way different slash bad. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Double but I've sword. been watching your videos to... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, they really help. Okay, well, cool. That, that makes me feel happy. Did you want to stick around for this lesson? Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you're here. Chris is not here. Chris, you have no excuse. All right. Um, let's continue on. So what is this? Oh, I don't know why I wrote a random line right there. Let's get rid of that. That doesn't correspond to that height. Okay, so this height right here um, is what? Andrea, I haven't heard from you. Andrea, what's this height right here? F of C. Exactly, yeah, F of C. Yeah, so the heights are always F of whatever, and then we always have the X coordinate that I randomly chose. I cho randomly chose A to be right there, C and B. So we're okay with just the notation. A is the X coordinate, F of A is the Y coordinate, and they're, therefore corresponds to this Y coordinate on the Y axis, F of A. Okay, so I want to create a definition for what a maximum means. What is the highest point on this graph and you guys can clearly see like hey the the highest you can get is right there the most altitude the the biggest uh, y coordinate that you can get is at that point exactly at c or i guess the height is f of c how do we define that mathematically though that's kind of the the driving question for today we want to say it's the point that is higher than all of the rest so fiona how yeah what are your thoughts would it be like x is you're really really close actually yeah so it you don't want to use x's though because x's talk about left and right um we want to talk about up and down so we want to say this y coordinate so we're going to say this f of c here this y coordinate so we'll say this f of c is bigger than all the other y coordinates f of c is we're going to say greater than or equal to, right? It's bigger than or equal to all the other y-coordinates. How do we say all y-coordinates? Any ideas? It's going to be f of something, right? Anyone want to take a guess? How do we say all, all other y-coordinates? It's a little bit tricky because you've never seen it before. You want to go for it again, Fiona? Would it be f of like infinity? Ah, that, that, would, that would make so much sense to me. I, I would prefer that. Um, they say f of x. x can be everything. We haven't defined x to be anything. x is everything. x is infinite. And therefore, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. So this is the definition of a maximum. If you come down here and you say maximum, what is that? We're going to say it's some f of c that is greater than or equal to all other f of x. So I know that the notation here is confusing. F of whatever means it's a Y coordinate. We're talking about Y coordinates for this definition. The Y coordinate of C is greater than or equal to all of the other Y coordinates. X is all of the other X coordinates. And then if I put an F in front of it, it's the Y coordinate of that X. Okay. So we know the definition for maximum. Someone aside from Fiona now, since I've been having basically a one-on-one -on -one conversation, what is the definition of a minimum? Can you just write it out right here? It's basically the same thing. You gotta switch something though. Who wants to take a shot at it? Yeah, Andrea. Is it the same thing, just less than? Exactly. F of f x. F, f of c is less than f of x. Less than f of x, like that? Yeah. You're really close. You have to say less than or equal to though. And why? It's because of this. Let me give you a graph over here. So there's my coordinate plane, and I'm going to go ahead and just make a straight line. This is a maximum. This is also a maximum. That's also a maximum because all of them are the same height. So it can also be equal to the heights that are left and right of it, too. So sometimes you have weird things that are happening right here. Technically, that is a maximum. It is less than or equal to the heights that are left and right of it. So it's... it's just being very, very specific with our language. Okay, so um, I really wanna quickly cover types of intervals too. Um, we have the difference between a closed interval and an open interval. And it's, it's not that hard. Closed interval just means you actually have points, heights and stuff that are defined at these two coordinates. So F of A, actually exists, f of b actually exists. Um, so the way that you'll see a closed interval when you see the AP test is a is less than or equal to x 
which is less than or equal to B. If you see those equal to signs, you can be equal to them on your interval. And then on open interval, it's the other way around, right? So you say A is less than X, which is less than B. You cannot be equal to those points. Those points, the height at A is not defined. If I try to draw a wall through A, it doesn't hit the function anywhere. It's not defined. I cannot have an equal to sign. Um, sometimes they do um, other notation too. I don't know if you guys are remembering this. If you have like an A comma B with uh, square brackets, square brackets means you can be equal to, and therefore the, the other parentheses, this curvy parentheses, I just call them normal parentheses. Normal parentheses, A comma B, you cannot be equal to. And being open or closed will affect the problem now. Like it's one of those things where it's like, eh, it's okay if it's open or closed. Like if it's open, then you cannot use one of the theorems. Like it, it's really important to know these differences now, especially for AP calculus. All right. If you guys have to slow me down, tell me to slow down. Otherwise I'm going to move on to like the, the meat of today's lesson. Now that we have all of this notation and stuff out of the way. It's all about notation. Here we go. Intermediate value theorem, and it is spelled intermediate, if I spelled it correctly, IVT. We'll just call it IVT from now on just because intermediate is maybe a little bit hard to say. But yeah, if you say IVT, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so each of these, we're going over three theorems this unit. We're doing two today, and then on 1-9 or something crazy later, we're doing MVT. We're gonna do only three. You need to have all of these three down. All of them have a similar format. They need something, and then once they have that need met, then they automatically prove the following, automatically. Okay, if f of x is continuous. If it's continuous, and I guess we can abbreviate by C-O-N-T and then a period. If it's continuous, then it will prove the following. And again, what does continuous mean? So I'm gonna wait. For you guys to write some stuff down and also when you finish writing down think how do I think of continuous what's the kindergarten explanation of continuous and then once you have the kindergarten explanation what is the formal definition that you might have forgotten from Friday but you need to eventually have memorized the continuity test what is it formally saying being continuous so I'll go ahead and pause recording here too all right continuous what does it mean? Go. Who just got it? A telemarketer trying to call me during my lesson? I think not. Continuous. No? Okay, so I will remind us once again. Continuous is, if I have my pencil, I can draw the entire function from negative infinity all the way out to infinity without ever picking up my pencil. That's the kindergartner definition of continuity. We all nod our heads, oh yeah, that's, we remember that now, yeah? Okay, the formal definition is the continuity test and that's using limits. It's saying the limit or the height that I approach from the left, the limit, the left-hand limit I should say, the height that I approach from the left, the left-hand limit is equal to the right hand limit, the height that I approach from the right, which is also equal to the actual height. And you can break that in a, in a bunch of different ways and we saw that in like our first homework assignment. But it's the left limit is equal to the right limit is equal to the actual height. And you, I don't know if I can, let me try to draw that out. So the left limit comes to the same height as the right limit, but that's not enough because I might not have a height there. It's also equal to the actual height at that point. And that means that it's a nice continuous line. I never have to pick up my pencil. If the lem left limit wasn't equal to the right limit, you jump. If the left limit was equal to the right limit, but wasn't actually equal at that point, again, you have to pick up your pencil. Okay, so if you are continuous, then it proves that your function passes through all, and this is the keyword here, heights. If you have to underline anything in this entire theorem, like underline circle star heights. This is a theorem that proves heights. 
So I'm going to like circle it, double circle it, maybe also box it. Let's do a smiley face, a star. It proves heights. Maybe some fireworks coming off of this. Heights. It proves heights. IVT proves heights. Did you think IVT proves a maximum or minimum? You are incorrect. It proves heights. And not only does it prove heights, it proves that all of the heights between F of A and F of B are hit at least once. It might be hit twice. It might be hit an infinite number. Well, maybe not infinite. It might be a hit a hundred times, but it hits it at least once. That's all we know. And you might be thinking that's not a very powerful theorem. Okay. If you are continuous, which seems to be a lot of functions, like any polynomial function, then yeah, it goes through at least once. What does that even say? Okay. So here is your picture definition of IVT. Say we have some points. I randomly picked point A and point B. Notice that in the first example, it's an open interval. It's not actually defined at these ends. And the second one, it's a closed at the beginning and open. It doesn't matter what sort of beginning and end you have, if it's open or closed, it does not matter. Look, I only need to be continuous. As long as I have a straight line, then I will hit at least one point or all points between F of A and F of B, at least one. So I want you guys right now, go ahead and draw a function. And it has to be a function. So a function, this is not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. This is not a function because again, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Pat, like draw a normal continuous function. I just went like that. I'm, I'm kind of boring. So maybe you could do something like that. There's my function. The important thing about my example is that I have a height that is above my end height and I have a height that's below my end height. That's a, this is gonna be a good example because it will also show you something that IVT does not prove. Okay, and we're gonna be doing a second one in a second. I'm gonna see if you guys can play around with it for the second example. This one is for us to play around. This second one is for you guys to play around. Am I just talking too much? Yes, but I think this is good. Okay, so I want to annotate this diagram. This point right here is A comma F of A. We can all nod our heads. Yeah, you, we just went over that. I don't need to review that too much. This point over here is B comma F of B. That means that this height over here, that I, I randomly went through that height, that was not on purpose, it doesn't need to go through that. This height over here is F of B, this height down here is F of A. Okay, so in terms of the X coordinates and the Y coordinates, we're gonna kind of think about this as a rectangle. Go ahead and just sketch a rectangle. In fact, I'm gonna sketch it too, so. I have this rectangle that hits that point, comes through the height, stops at B, goes up to this height. Here's our rectangle. This is kind of like our special IVT rectangle. So if I choose, like this is maybe a computer will choose anything, any Y coordinate in between or any Y coordinate that's in this rectangle, I am guaranteed to hit every single one of these lines, every single one of these heights at least once. I can choose any height I want inside of this rectangle in terms of a Y coordinate. Any one of these Y coordinates, I will pass through at least once. How do I know this? Because check this out. Let's go ahead and undo all those lines. Let's, let's choose one of them and prove this to you, right? I'm gonna choose uh, this height right here. Well, like if I extend that line, yeah, look, I hit it at least once right there. I'm gonna choose another one. Boom. Oh yeah, it hits it at least once there. I'm guaranteeing no matter what height I pick in this interval, I will hit that height at least once. And that seems kind of silly, right? Because of course I'm gonna hit it. Look, there's a giant line that goes right through it. Of course it's gonna hit. And I'm hoping this, you're like hitting your forehead like, well, duh. IVT is kind of one of those duh theorems. Like, of course it's gonna hit once you understand what it's asking for. But what it doesn't prove, and this is kind of the key thing, is that things outside of that rectangle, I might not hit. For example, maybe my function went like this. Let me draw a second function that's not as cool. It goes like this. If I did a height up here green, that does not hit the function anymore. This height is not in this little rectangle. And if I draw this line out and out, yeah, it doesn't hit the function anywhere. There's no line that intersects. This function here does not go to this height. It is not verified if you're outside of that rectangle. So once again, this theorem is saying, hey, if you're continuous, if you hold down your pencil and don't pick it up, then if you make this rectangle, I guess, any X coordinate that's valid between your starting A and your starting B 
has a corresponding y value that will hit be hit at least once, if not more than once. Okay, I've said that more than one time. I want you guys to try to break it. Go ahead and draw another function over here on the right. See if that works. Go ahead and draw the function. Draw your IVT rectangle and see, does that actually work? Can you somehow punch a hole in this theorem and be like, oh, I found an exception. And I cannot find an exception. Oh, maybe I, let's try a function that you guys maybe not have, maybe not, maybe have not seen. Let's try something that has a sharp corner. What if I do that? Something that goes chunk, 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 chunk. Sharp corners, will that break it? No, because if I still draw my rectangle, I still, any height that I choose will intersect at least once, if not more than once. How do I break this? Oh, I could break it by doing this. What if I go like this and then jump over a certain height? Ha ha, I've broken it. Okay, I have my rectangle. I have my rectangle. Look, I chose this height here, but that doesn't intersect anywhere. Ha ha ha, I've broken IVT. But wait, now it's not continuous. I need it to be continuous. Darn it. I am not allowed to pick up my pencil. So hopefully you, you're seeing with me playfully showing you, you need to be continuous. If you're continuous, you're going to pass through all heights in that IVT rectangle. So I'll, I'll write for this example, not continuous. Okay, let's move on to extreme value theorem, the second of our two theorems. This one is even easier as long as you've memorized the notation. So let me test you guys. This one, and I'm gonna give it to Eva. Wahaha, make you participate. This thing right here, what does that mean? It's a bunch of fancy math, but it has one three letter word that is so associated with it. What is f of c is less than or equal to f of x? What does this thing mean? And it is from that front side of the notes up here. If you can see it somewhere. Is it talking about the heights of f of c and f of x? It is talking about the heights of c and x, yeah. But then you're going to use either, you can say it's either a min or it's a max. Is this a min or a max down here that it's asking about? True. Minimum? Yeah. It is indeed a minimum, yeah. Everyone label it. And then Teflon, what is this one? This other one. Max. Max. Cool. So extreme value theorem proves extremes. So um, I'll, I'll call these things extremas. Another name for the category, or extremas is a category. Minimums and maximums are types of extremas. Or extreme mums, is it extreme mums or extremas? I need to look that up, but they're extremes. The most extreme thing you can get to the top, the most extreme thing you can get at the bottom. So what do you need in order to prove this thing? You need it to be both continuous, ten U O U S, and a second thing too. First thing continuous, second thing it also needs to be closed. And we know what it means to be closed because we just went over that on the front side of our notes. Closed means that it has, you either see this symbol or this symbol. If you have one of those two symbols or maybe a graph where they're both solid points instead of open points, that means that you have a closed interval. So if it's closed and it's continuous, if those two things are met, then what do we know? We know that the minimum and maximum exists, which is, in my opinion, kind of lame. <laughs> like, wow, there, there is one. Where? At what value? Tell us more. No, I'm not going to tell you anymore. I just know that they're there somewhere. That's all this theorem says. If I'm continuous, if I don't pick up my pencil, and I know that I have an actual end and start value with actual defined heights, that I know that there, are, there is one minimum. I know that there is at least one maximum. That's it. I know it exists. And let's, let's prove this with a graph, and then we're basically done with the notes. So if I have a wavy graph, shoink, shoink, and let's do, I don't know, something that looks like that. Just try to break this as much as you can. Continuous, which means you can't pick up your pencil. Close, which means I, I made it close already for you. So these points exist. On this interval, there's some maximum or minimum value. Look, maximum right there. Minimum, in this case, the minimum is down here. 
the minimum is actually at an endpoint. So the minimum height is right there. The maximum height, it might've been there. I don't know, it might've been at the start. Um, look, there's the maximum right here. There's the minimum down there. Is it possible to make a graph that does not have a maximum or minimum? Ooh, I can think of one that might work. Let me try to punch a hole in this. A maximum or a minimum that doesn't work. Maybe instead of doing a W function, I know I have technology so I can do this and you can't, but what if I did this? I can, because here, I'm, I'm not gonna pick up my pencil, ready? Where's the maximum? Where's the minimum? Okay, okay. They're all maximums and they're all minimums. That's a maximum, that's a maximum, that's a minimum, that's a minimum. In this case, I have an infinite number of maximum and minimums. So it seems like I might have broken it, but no, every single one of these is a max and a minimum. In fact, I have an infinite number of max and mins. So darn, I, I tried to disprove it, but I couldn't. Okay, so that's EVT, that's IVT, and you need to be going over these again and again with flashcards on my website. Okay, IVT, it needs continuous, it proves heights in that IVT rectangle. What does EVT prove? Hey, if I'm continuous and I'm closed, then I have a minimum and I have a maximum. That's it. That's the end of the notes. Um, and I, I'm going to go look on Khan Academy to see if there's a corresponding homework assignment. I know there's going to be at least one time where Khan Academy is going to be like, eh, I don't know what to assign for that and I, you might not have any homework for that night, but let me see. Assign content, AP Calculus. If I can't find anything on Khan Academy, then I'm just gonna make you guys go do your flashcards on Quizlet. Might as well stop the recording too.